and uh, let's start with the first slide, please. The current situation. I'll talk um, mainly on uh, the history of the German experience in recent years, uh, plus Austria, but always with a look uh, at what I think is important uh, in order to, uh, to understand the threat uh, to Western and Central Europe uh, in these days. And I think the, the threat has been, has been outlined quite recently um, with the attacks uh, in France, three of them, one in Paris, one in the surroundings, one in Nice, um, then one in Germany in Dresden, and especially the attack in Vienna in early November 2020. There have, of course, been more failed and thwarted plots, but these uh, five attacks, I think, show us uh, certain char characteristics of the situation uh, right now. First, jihadist ideology is more widespread in Europe than ever. And I will explain later that I think that has a lot to do with the IS experience, simply because IS um, converted so many young Muslims to jihadist ideology, many more than Al-Qaeda ever did. Secondly, lone wolf terrorists become more effective. They have become, they have been quite effective in other fields, right-wing terrorists in Europe, especially in Germany, in Norway, but also in other places, have always been more lethal than the Islamists. That might have to do uh, with the access uh, to arms, uh, with the access to advanced training in the armed forces of countries like Germany, the Scandinavian countries, France, well, France less so, uh, and, and Britain. Um, but there is something changing. And I think that the main um, that the main difference uh, to former days is that now we have an or organization that is directing or guiding attacks again. And there I tend to disagree with the ambassador. Um, I, don't, I do not think that, uh, that the major uh, development that we have seen in recent years is IS inspiring attacks. Of course, some of these attacks seems to seem to have been inspired. At, as far as I know, that does, there, there, there hasn't been a direct connect, a connection to IS, uh, from IS to the attacks in France, nor in Germany, but there has been one in Austria. If you take a look uh, at the Austrian attack, uh, we do see an ethnic Albanian, Kuitim Feizulahi, uh, from North Macedonia, who was born in Austria, and who was in contact with IS in the months before he perpetrated the attack. And the organization in recent years has, has established um, a methodology for these guided or directed attacks, which are not organized by, the, by, by, by IS. They are not inspired by IS, but they are, uh, they are guided. The perpetrator of the attack in some way uh, gets in contact with IS planners with IS propagandists via social media, who then coach him um, until the attack happens. And what they ask him to do um, before he perpetrates uh, the attack is uh, to film a video in which he claims responsibility for the attack, in which he swears loyalty, pledges loyalty uh, to the current leader of the organization, and then sends the video back either to his handler or to the uh, IS media station Ahamak. This has happened in lots of terrorist attacks in recent years, especially in 2016 in Germany. Um, the attack uh, in Berlin in December 2016 was such a guided attack. The one in Sweden, uh, where the terrorist used a truck in March 2000. Um, 17 was also such a guided attack. I think the attack using a truck in July 2016 in Nice, France was such a directed or guided attack. And this is the major innovation uh, of IS in terrorist tactics in recent years. And the most worrying uh, observation about the events in fall 2020 in Europe has been that at least in one of these cases, the Vienna case, IS has gone back, has, has again managed to guide uh, such, uh, such an attack. Next slide, please.
Thank you. And uh, as, I, as I promised, uh, I'll go back a little bit uh, in history to show what I think is important um, in European developments in recent years. Uh, the German example, the nucleus of uh, German recruitment and radicalization uh, into IS was a propaganda group called Milatu Ibrahim or the community of Abraham or the nation of Abra Abraham after a book by the famous uh, jihadist ideologist Abu Muhammad al-Maqdisi. It was a propaganda group early on ideologically aligned with the Islamic State in, in Iraq and it recruited the first generation of Syria fighters. And as soon as it popped up in Germany in late 2011, recruitment for the war in Syria started and the numbers rose to unprecedented levels in 2013 and, in, uh, and especially in 2014. In spite of countermeasures, quite effective countermeasures uh, by the German government, which outlawed the propaganda group already in June 2012, after which its members fled to Egypt, then Libya, then to Turkey, and then to, uh, then to Syria. But what is important, I think, is that the radicalization and recruitment experience of these early years, 2011, 2012, 2013, still shapes the situation and has recruited thousands of young uh, Europeans into the IS orbit, at least ide ideologically. The next slide, please. As I just said, Milatu Ibrahim was banned in 2012 and afterwards recruitment in Germany and Austria, but also in other countries was decentralized from 2013. We have big mosque associations, uh, associations which sent dozens of fighters to Syria. I've mentioned uh, in the slide Fusilet 33 in Berlin, probably the most notorious jihadist mosque uh, in Germany in recent years. Charismatic preachers played a role. I mention Mirza Omerovic in Vienna, not because Vienna is a German city, but because Omerovic was important not only for recruitment in Austria, but also um, in Bosnia, in Serbia, and also in Germany. We, have, we had nationwide groups called the True Religion and the Reed Campaign who recruited. We saw that with the advent of many, many charismatic preachers, they went to smaller cities in, in order to find an audience. Cities like Wolfsburg, Bremen and Dienstlaken in Germany suddenly became centers of uh, recruitment and radicalization after uh, the big cities did not provide these preachers with the necessary space, with the necessary dis uh, discursive space um, anymore. But what is important about this decentralization is not, um, are not the details, but the, what is important is that it is so hard to fight such a decentralized scene. So ironically, the uh, ban of Milatu Ibrahim, the central recruitment, recruiting organization in Germany, um, led to a situation in, in where it was first extremely hard um, to monitor uh, the recruitment processes, which led um, to travel movements by so many Germans uh, to Syria, but also to um, an increasingly vivid, to an increasingly diverse jihadist scene, which was dominated by IS recruitment, but which sent people to other groups as well. Next slide, please. And if you take a look at the situation in Syria in 2012 and 2013, the result is obvious. Germans um, joined lots of different groups. The most important were Junud Asham, the soldiers of Syria, uh, a Chechen organization with many Austrians, many Germans and many Turks joining its ranks, especially in early 2013. Majlis Shur al-Mujahideen, a group led by Syrians with strong connections to the Islamic State early on, which uh, recruited Belgian and French jihadists who be became notorious in 2015 when they perpetrated the attacks in Paris. And the Chechen organization Jaysh al-Muhajirin wal-Ansar, which later on joined ISIS, but brought an, ex uh, an extremely high number 
of Caucasians, I mean, Caucasians in the, in the European usage of the word, of Caucasians, Chechens uh, from the Caucasus, from Turkey, but also from countries like Austria to uh, Syria. At that time, only some Germans managed to enter organizations like uh, the Nusra Front, simply because the Nusra Front demanded um, Arabic language knowledge, something many Europeans uh, couldn't, couldn't offer. And it, uh, it demanded a, a recommendation, uh, Taskiya, from inside the organization. As a result, uh, the Nusra Front lost many of these fighters who joined smaller foreign fighter organizations uh, to ISIS from late 2013. But the tradition of Germans, Austrians, and others, also French and Belgians, who joined different organizations in the early stages of the war, later on, after ISIS was beaten militarily, um, had repercussions on the structure of recruitment efforts. And I'll come, I'll come back to that a little bit later. The next slide, please. The first results uh, of the situation uh, in, in, uh, in Syria, in Europe, could be seen from 2015, but uh, especially in 2016. It turned out that returning foreign fighters were a threat but according to my interpretation, not the major, uh, major one. There were reports uh, of plots being hatched in Syria for Germany, but all were foiled or thwarted. If we take a closer look at the attacks in Germany in 2016, it is interesting to see that four out of five were di directed or guided by IS, although the perpetrators, with one example, had not been um, to Syria um, beforehand. Two were perpetrated by Germans who had not traveled to Syria, and three were perpetrated by, well, let's call them refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, and Tunisia. And I think the most important ob observation is that in so many cases in 2016 and later on, Terrorist attacks here in, in Europe were perpetrated by people who did not go to Syria. Foreign fighters are, of course, a threat. Um, foreign fighters, um, I think I mixed something up here. Because I'm, I'm already in the next slide, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but what I think is important that foreign fighters in many cases, first, they go to jail in most countries. Others have, their, have made their experience and might not be ready to perpetrate attacks. Others might be monitored by the security services or they might think that they are monitored by the security services. And on the other hand, we've got all these young people who are now being introduced to, I, uh, to IS ideology, but do not make the experience of actual jihad in Syria or Iraq. And I think that has shown, um, that has shown in some European countries in recent years that the major threat might be those who did not go. And just take a look at those people who, uh, at those people who perpetrated the attacks in uh, France, Germany, um, and Austria in fall 2020, and you will realize that these people did not, not go to did not go to Syria, but by like the Vienna uh, attacker having having access to some kind of guidance by IS, or in other cases at least uh, access to to weapons, they perpetrated quite. Um, effective attacks. And I'll come to the major trends now that I see um, in the development of the terrorist uh, threat in Germany and uh, Europe. So the next slide, please. First, IS keeps directing and guiding attacks in Germany and Europe. Uh, the Vienna example might, might only be the beginning, but it shows us that there are structures that are still Aiming at uh, um, aiming at 
perpetrate plotting attacks here in Europe. Although most plots after 2017, I would say 2016 is not correct, have been thwart, uh, thwarted, Vienna is a notable uh, exception and I think it's a warning sign. At the same time, uh, I've seen reports about the survival of parts of IS external operations in recent, uh, in recent months. And what I would rather like to argue that what we have seen in recent years is not a total stop of IS external operations, but rather members of IS external operations building up cells uh, in a decentralized way. To give you an example, the attack in Vienna is suspected to have been coached, guided, directed by IS XOPS in Italy. There are members, former members of IX, uh, IS external operations in Turkey, and there are rumors um, among security officials in this country at least that Kosovo and possibly Albania uh, is one or, or two of the places where the organization might have thought about um, building new bases for external operations in the coming years. Trend number, major trends number two, the next slide, please. Um, equally important, I think, is that IS pro provinces, although some of them are weak and weakened, have gained in importance since 2016. There are first, uh, there is first evidence for travel movements of IS supporters to IS Libya, especially in 2000, until 2016. There have been some Germans who tried to go to Egypt to join IS on the Sinai. There have been even Germans going to the Philippines and uh, to Afghanistan, although the evidence is scarce. And as it seems, most of those who tried to leave Germany direction Afghanistan and the Philippines have either been caught beforehand by the German authorities or have been caught on the way. Just to give an example, a small group of young Germans in 2017 tried to uh, reach Afghanistan via Iran and does not seem to have reached its destinations. At the same time, there are some efforts to direct external operations from Libya as we have seen in 2017, uh, in 2016 and two, 2017, the perpetrator of the attack here in Berlin in December 2016 was in contact with handlers in Libya. And in recent months, there have been reports of um, IS Afghanistan members being in contact with uh, supporters of the organization here in Europe. These reports have not been confirmed independently. But still, um, the difference, the difference to the situation in 2014 and 2015 perhaps is that now it is a lot harder to monitor uh, operations um, emanating from countries as diverse as the Philippines, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and, uh, and so on. While in former times we had uh, Syria as the center of uh, jihadist plots for Europeans. The next slide, please. And I stressed the decentralization of recruitment and uh, radicalization in Germany in 2011, 12, 13, in the beginning so much, because we do see um, um, quite a worrying trend in Sir Syria right now. IS has lost some, some of its attractiveness for Germans and other Europeans in recent years, probably because it does not, it cannot claim uh, to be an Islamic state anymore. And uh, that is why we have seen an upsurge in recruitment by HTS and Hurras ad din since 2017. I've seen an increasing number of Germans, many of them Turks, some Arabs, leaving the country in 2016 and joining these organizations in, in the coming years. Uh, to be frank, I can't say whether they went to HTS or whether they joined uh, Horraz ad-Din afterwards. Um, but uh, there is evidence that HTS has more than just a presence in, uh, in Syria. Uh, there, have, uh, there have been arrests of alleged HTS uh, support networks 
financing networks here in Germany in 2020 and I think even this year. And the most interesting development is, the most interesting characteristic of this recruitment is that among the recruits um, there are some Arabs but there are many Turks. German Turks are overrepresented and I think one of the reasons could be that Turkish um, that Turkish language or Turkish um, supporters of the organization um, are have less problems to reach Syria via Turkey than many of the others who are caught by the Turks and sent back to their home countries. So the, the so the question for the coming months for me is first to what extent HTS and uh, Horras ad Din plan to perpetrate attacks outside of Syria. We don't know yet. My working hypothesis is that HTS is not that much interested in uh, becoming active uh, outside of the country. But the problem is, the big problem about HTS is that it receives at least passive support by Turkey. Um, and if my, uh, my observation is true, if it's correct that uh, Turkish, uh, that diaspora Turks from Germany, Austria and other European countries uh, are a strong force within jihadist circles um, in, um, in Syria. They might at least in the long run become uh, a totally different um, threat to Europe than the threat we have seen uh, we have seen until now, where the Turks have been rather underrepresented um, in IS recruitment. And uh, I thank you very much. And I'll also say that on the next slide. Thank you.